Today on Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy. The Christian is not a daydreamer, but is wholly committed to what is in front of them each and every day. They put their hand to the plow with enthusiasm. The Christian is not an escape artist trying to wriggle or jiggle free from routine faithfulness. When we think of the Christian life and living a life pleasing to God, we often associate it with the need to change. But did you know there are also times when God calls us to remain the same? Today on Know the Truth, we're beginning a new message about God's call to remain and what it is that He wants us to continue to do and be. Join us in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 17 through 24, and learn what it means to remain as you are. Now, here's Philip DeCourcy with today's message. Okay, let's take our Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians 7, verses 17 to 24. We're still in our series, Take the Call. We are looking at specific passages in the New Testament where the word call is to be found. Because I don't know about you, but as I live, I want to answer God's call. The God who gave me life, I think, has a purpose for me in life, and that's the life I want to live. We're going to look at the subject, Called to Remain. I believe that God has called you to remain where you are, doing what you're doing, unless He makes it objectively clear He's got something else. And let me make my case here. Paul's writing to the church at Corinth, verse 17 of chapter 7. He's answering a series of questions. He's been dealing with the issue of should a believer stay with an unbeliever in marriage after coming to faith? And Paul says, yes. If the unbeliever is willing, you should remain in your marriage. And that triggers a thought where Paul now begins to expand, just digresses onto this issue about the believer in relation to every relationship and circumstance in life. And here's what he says in verse 17. But as God has distributed to each one, as the Lord has called each one, so let him walk. And so I ordain in all the churches. Was anyone called while circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Was anyone called while uncircumcised? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing. And uncircumcision is nothing. But the keeping of the commandments of God is what matters. Let each one remain in the same calling in which he was called. Were you called while a slave? Do not be concerned about it, but if you can be free, rather use it. For he who is called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's free man. Likewise, he who is called while free is Christ's slave. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brethren, let us each one remain with God in that state in which he was called. I want to speak on remain as you are from 1 Corinthians 7, 17 to 24. Jim Elliott was one of five missionaries martyred for the cause of the gospel in 1956. He was trying to reach some remote tribes in Ecuador for Christ. It's a life worth looking into. His journal entries and gospel reflections across his life are clarifying, compelling, and convicting. Here's three of my favorites. He's famous for saying, wherever you are, be all there. Live to the hilt every situation you believe to be the will of God. It's that last quote I want to run with in the light of the passage we're about to look at in 1 Corinthians 7, 17 to 24. Wherever you are, be all there. Live to the hilt every situation you believe to be the will of God. Now, the sentiment behind that statement, guys, is that God wants us to be fully present wherever we are, actually present. 
The Christian is not a daydreamer, but is wholly committed to what is in front of them each and every day. They put their hand to the plow with enthusiasm. The Christian is not an escape artist trying to wriggle or jiggle free from routine faithfulness. In fact, in his book, The Balancing of the Christian Life, Charles Rowry of Dallas Theological Seminary has a chapter called Routine Faithfulness. And as I looked at it again this week in the light of what we're about to study, I think what he says is rather challenging. Here's what he says. Too often, messages on the spiritual life focus on crisis experiences in the believer's life. The exhortations of such messages normally call for some crisis decision. If a Christian hears such sermons year after year, either he becomes insensitive to the constant ringing of the alarm bell, or he associates spirituality with some crisis experience. Admittedly, we often need calls to decision, and certainly spiritual principles should be applied in the crises of life. But it is equally true that since most of our time is spent in the routines of life, we ought to apply spirituality in these areas as well. Spirituality will show up in routine faithfulness. The Christian is not an escape artist. The Christian's not a daydreamer. Wherever the Christian is, he's all in. He's all there. He accepts it as the will of God. He remains there and lives it for God's glory. That's a good word of caution. Although the Christian life brings about a radical change on the inside, it doesn't necessarily bring a radical change on the outside. Conversion is a change of attitude rather than a change of atmosphere. When Christ calls a man to follow him, he does not call a man to leave his family and his employment or separate from society. When Christ calls a man to follow him, he calls a man to live as a Christian where he is when he answered the call to follow Christ. That's what Paul's arguing here in 1 Corinthians 7, verses 17 through 24. And he says it three times, verse 17. But as God has distributed to each one, as the Lord has called each one, so let him walk. Verse 20, let each one remain in the same calling in which he was called. Verse 24, brethren, let each one remain with God in that state in which he was called. I think Paul's trying to say something. All good communicators use repetition. And that's what Paul's doing. He's underlining something important. Here's something I want to say to you. Maybe it's the summarizing of my message. Where you are. Just pause. I don't know where you guys have come from. I don't know your zip code, your address. We've heard a little bit about some of the new visitors' employment. But where you are and what you are doing, so long as it is not immoral, is where God wants you to be and what God wants you to do. I've just simplified your life right now. That's the message Paul's saying. He's basically saying what Jim Elliot said. Be all there. And what you perceive to be God's will, live to the hilt. Your present situation, it's God's will for your life presently. Let me say that again. Your present situation is God's will for your life presently. In a real sense, when it comes to to what you should be doing, you should be doing what you're doing. The Christian life calls you to abide in Christ and bloom where you're planted. How radical. And yet it's not that radical. And here's another call then. Remember, this is the ninth message in this series. We're called by the gospel. We're called out of darkness. We're called into fellowship. We're called to belong. We're called heavenward. We're called to suffering. We're called to peace. In the last two months, we looked at call to holiness. Now we're called to remain. Just watch the itchy feet syndrome. You don't need to be that upward and immobile to fulfill God's purpose for your life. Uh, Just rereading John Stott this month on vocation. I love what he says. This is This is at the heart of this series, guys. If God has a purpose for the lives of his people, and if that purpose is discoverable, then nothing's more important than for you to discern it and decide it. 
It's true. And that's what we're doing in this series. God's purpose for your life is discernible and you should be doing it. And, and here's what you should be doing. You should be doing what you're doing so long as it's not illegal and immoral. Now, let me put the text in its context before we work through it quickly. Why would Paul insert this kind of digression here in chapter 7? I think because a radical view of the Christian life had taken hold in Corinth. They had certainly bought into the idea that Paul would write about in the second letter, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature, right? And all things pass away and all things become new. As my old pastor said in Northern Ireland, if there's no change, there's something strange. Okay, they bought into the, the transformation, outworking of faith in Jesus Christ, but some had taken it to a wrong place. And they had concluded that all things that belong to your past life should be put in the past. And so they started to think through, well, you know what? I need to divorce my unbelieving spouse. I need to break off my relationships with all my friends outside of Christ. I need to disengage from the everyday world that I have, you know, been part of and a web of up until this moment. In fact, that's the verses that precede our verses. In verses 12 to 16, Paul has to answer the idea, well, okay, now that I'm a Christian, that means I'm unequally yoked. When I got married, I wasn't a believer. But now that I'm a believer, I'm now married to an unbeliever. Do, do I stay? Do I leave? Do I remain? Do I divorce? And Paul argues, no, if the unbeliever is willing to live with you, then stay. But if the unbeliever can live with you or, you know, demands that you disobey Christ to remain, then let them go. But basically his argument, no, you stay. Your Christian presence and Christian practice sanctifies the home, sanctifies the marriage. And marriage is a creation ordinance anyway, not just a Christian ordinance, not just for Christians, it's for unbelievers as well. But they had fallen foul of an extreme radical idea that the old life must be repudiated in all its elements. And so Paul says no. And he goes on this digression. Now that he's kind of dealing with that, he just you know, spreads the net a little bit further. And he wants them to know that the Christian life is compatible with life. So important. That's such a simple statement. But it's important that you and I embrace that. Because there was a time in the church when Christians embraced the idea of asceticism and monasticism and a severing of their life from life. To be spiritual was to disengage from the everyday affairs of life. And Paul says, no, the Christian life is compatible with life. It's not unspiritual to play sports. It's not unspiritual to be married to an unbeliever. It's not unspiritual to have a job down at the factory. The Christian life is compatible with life in its social context, so long as it's not illegal or immoral. He's basically saying the Christian life can be lived without a monastery. The Christian life is lived within everyday life, which means that, listen to this, that means with Pre-conversion responsibilities and relationships are not irrelevant and not irreverent. That's worth embracing, and that's the point. So let's look at the text. Four things, the persistent rule, the providential reality, the practical ramification, the primary relationship. We'll move through these as quick as we can. The persistent rule. You see, when the gospel enters a man's life, he does not exit life or retreat from life. He re-engages life, a different man, a man in Christ, a man after Christ, and he has now these new sanctifying impulses and influences that touch his life. Picking up that theme, Paul reminds the Corinthians that they were somewhere when they got saved. They were in a web of relationships. They were in a social context when God put his hand on their shoulder and called them to faith in Jesus Christ. And Paul is now saying, live out your post-conversion life in the context of your pre-conversion life for God's glory. Don't be embarrassed by your old life as long as it's not illegal or immoral. Continue it. 
Sanctify it. Use it for God's glory. Embrace the providence of God because now that you're saved, God has purposed for you to be saved in that marriage to sanctify it. God has purposed for you to be saved with regards to the street you live in so it's your witness for Jesus Christ. God saves all kinds of people in all kinds of places for this one purpose, to be salt and light throughout the world. And that's why God wants us to stay put and to speak up and to stand up. You don't need to seek a monastery. You don't need to become a minister. You don't need to become a missionary. I think the majority of Christians at some point, as soon as they get saved, they're not long into it. They've heard some messages on discipleship and living your life for God's glory. And you go, boy, does that mean I got to become a missionary, go to school, seminary? Seems that's a spiritual thing to do. And Paul's trying to burst that bubble. No, God wants you to be a Christian plumber, a Christian husband, a Christian teacher, a Christian student, a Christian coach. That's what he wants with a missionary mindset. As one of the brothers just said, I said, I love that little phrase that he was a school teacher. That's where he brings the fight. Because that's where God wants us to be. Remain where you are and display sanctifying impulses and influences for Jesus Christ. And that's the persistent rule. Verse 17, we have noted it. But as God has distributed to each one, as the Lord has called each one, so let him walk. Verse 20, puts it even more explicitly, let each one remain in the same calling in which he was called. Verse 24, brethren, let us each remain with God in that state in which we were called. I want to come back to that statement. We were somewhere in life connected to a bunch of people within a job or a pursuit in life. We were somewhere when God called us, and we're to continue that calling after He has called us in the gospel. There's two callings. Did you notice that in verse 20? One is produced by the sovereign grace of God in regeneration. The effectual call is how preachers put it. That's the call to Christ, right? 1 Corinthians 1 verse 9, called into fellowship with Him. Or you've got verse 26 of the same chapter, not many rich people are called, not many noble people are called. It's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. So there's that calling, the sovereign call of God in salvation. But there's another calling, which is the outworking of providence in a person's life. But I want you to understand that God was sovereign before He saved you. He didn't just become your sovereign when He saved you, which means that He ordered your life, your context, your gifts, your responsibility, your address, your mother and father, your family in His providence. And that which is not illegal and that which is not immoral, God has directly purposed, and He wants you to remain in that context to live it out for His glory, because He's got a purpose and a providence in that. Powerful. It's sanctifying and it's satisfying. The point Paul is making is that the Christian is to live his pre-conversion life, post-conversion, so long as it can glorify God. And you just got to get that down. You don't need to be embarrassed when you're in the presence of a pastor, that you're a plumber. You don't need to be embarrassed in the presence of a missionary if you're a teacher. You're remaining in the calling to which God called you, when He called you. Unless God has got something else for you clearly, don't be embarrassed. Get excited. Embrace it. Sanctify the station in life that God has called you in by your presence and by Christian practice. Now, it's time for a qualification. This is the general rule. He gives us it three times. He, he told them what he was going to tell them, then he told them, and then he told them what he told them. He wants them to get it. But it's a general rule, and he says it's for all the churches. But it's a general rule. It's not an absolute rule. Because although he'll tell the slave that if they've come to Christ in the midst of slavery, not to worry about it, but he does go on to say, if you have an opportunity to be free, embrace it. Take the change. You know, take the door out. In this chapter, he talks about his preference for singleness. He says, I'd like you to be like I am. Our sense is that he was a widower by this point. 
And Paul says, I find there's advantages for me being single. I've got more time to vote to the Lord. But <laughs> you know what? God also calls us to marriage. So this is a general rule, not an absolute rule. You might start out a laborer and end up one who labors in the word and doctrine as a pastor. You may be a business leader, and it might work out later in life that God calls you to the business of church leadership. So change is permissible, but the point is this, very important. Change is permissible, but the point is this, it's not automatic. The general rule is stay where you are until you have clear reasons to move on. Now, that's the persistent rule. A couple of things jump out about this. Number one, I think it's a word of contentment. It's a word of contentment. It's promoting happy contentment and rootedness. Rootedness. Two passages come to mind, Philippians 4, 10 to 13, 1 Thessalonians 4, 11 to 12. Philippians 4, Paul says, be content in whatever situation you're in. God will give you grace to live it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I love 1 Thessalonians 4, 11 to 12. You know what? Aspire. Make it your ambition to be quiet and mind your own business and do your work. There's something gloriously Christian about a man when the horn goes off at the factory, he's at his machine and he puts a good day's work in. He does it day in and day out. My father was one of those men. I think that's heroic. Decades in a job that's not that aspiring. But he does it. And he does it with dedication. Because God called him to live a quiet and peaceable life. My father's lived in the same house for 60 years. On the same street. And yet, several years ago, became the mayor of the borough in which he lives over 100,000 people. I think that's the fruit of rootedness, reputation in the community. You're listening to Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy, and that was the first part of a message called Remain As You Are from the Take the Call series. When you visit us online at ktt.org, you can hear more broadcasts from this series. You'll find helpful resources and also have the opportunity to make a difference by partnering with Know the Truth. The Bible demonstrates that when God calls us into His kingdom, He often equips us to be used right where we are. You don't have to be a pastor or a missionary to make a difference for God in the world. In fact, it's people just like you who keep this ministry going and make it all possible. When you give to know the truth, you become a vital part of our ministry by helping us reach more people everywhere with the gospel. So, will you stand with us today? You can sign up to give monthly, or you can give a special one-time donation. Just visit ktt.org or call 888-644-8811. And as a thank you for your gift of any amount, you'll receive an outstanding book by Derek Tidball titled, Called by God, Exploring Our Identity in Christ, where he addresses the different stages of a Christian's walk, starting with our conversion to Christ and concluding with our promotion to glory. Be sure to request this timely book when you give today. Again, call 888 888- 644-8811 or sign up online at ktt.org. And if you're new to Know the Truth, we have a free booklet from Pastor Philip we'd like to send you when you get in touch with us for the very first time. It's a devotional called Seven Days of Truth, Resting in God's Providence, and it's sure to be an encouragement to you. Look for this free booklet online at ktt.org. I'm Wayne Shepherd. Join us again Tuesday for the second part of this message, Remain As You Are, here on Know the Truth. Today's program was produced and sponsored by Know the Truth Incorporated. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free.